welcome to this podcast series on neo-charismatic leadership with author, leadership expert and coach, Dr. Gada Angawi and executive leader, Martin Headley, where they will both explore the recently published book, Neo-Charismatic Leadership and the coaching topics it covers. Martin, we are here today and we are about to start the first role of the first stage of new charismatic leadership. And I would like first to ask you to reflect on your own leadership. If you were to be appointed as a leader somewhere, Mm -hmm. and you, you have, I know you have the experiences, what would be the first thing you do as you take post? There are two. There are two contexts. Yeah, there there are two contexts in which I've been appointed into a particular leadership role. One was where it was an existing organisation that needed to change dramatically, and the others have been where I've been asked to create an organisation. Okay, so you'd think, oh, those are going to be very, very different. But in fact, I think the answer to your question is going to be it's the same because whether you've got an existing organization with a lot of people or you need to create an organization, which, of course, in time will have a lot of people, there is still an output. So, for example, when the board of directors hires you to do a particular role, there is an output, there is an expectation from them. And what you've got to do is take stock of the existing situation. Okay, so so what's going on? In what environment am I in? In what industry am I in? In what country am I in? What culture? You know, you you have to take stock of as many sort of systemic level aspects as you possibly can. And so really what I do is I, I take a look at those and I evaluate what needs to change. And I tend to do this by myself. I do get a little bit of input, but you know, I have to understand and believe in my own heart that I've got the right plan that is the right thing to do for everybody concerned, all of the stakeholders. Now, once that's done, um, I then start to talk to more people. And if it's an existing organization, try and make the case for a change with them. Uh, If it's a new organization, I just talk to new people and try and make a case for change and have them sign up and come along with me. So I think you know, the, the, the answer to your question is, oddly enough, is I'm, I'm evaluating. Okay, so the first thing I come in is you take stock of the situation and see what needs to change, how much does it need to change, and, you know, what, what do I think the change looks like so at least I can start selling a new vision to others yeah. and see if anybody wants to come along with me. Yeah, and you've mentioned um, observing other factors. Some of them are external, some of them are internal. If it's an existing organization, if it's a new organization, you also observe everything, the context itself. So the assessment of the environment is the first role of new charismatic leadership. And it might, uh, you know, people might say, but every leader does this. What's the difference? Yes, okay. Why why new charismatic leaders stand out in this role? What is it that they do differently here? So, yeah. Well, that's a good point. Is is it the um is it the new leader or is it the new manager? Mm. Okay. Um you said that all leaders do that. I'm going to challenge that a little bit okay. and say really good managers could come in and do the same thing and they could organize a change. But, you know, if you're looking for radically different, if you're looking for something totally new, then, you know, you are going to require a leader. So I would say, yes, people typically say, don't leaders always do this? But when you, if you're one of the people that say that, then perhaps you should be thinking about your definition of leader. Mm. And is it, you know, is it really all leaders? <laughs> because yeah. I, I think it's a, f- it's a special few that do that. Yeah. I think for me, it's like hiring an architect or hiring an interior designer. You either hire someone to make the place look beautiful, but really they don't get into the infrastructure or someone who designs the whole thing from all over again so that it becomes functional for now and for the future to come. 
someone who has a deeper vision, um, a, a wider perspective. And I think evaluation is something like this. With new charismatic leaders, it's not just let's assess the market. Let's see how we, uh, the product can be rolled out uh, in a successful way. It is actually they look at the whole structure of the departments and they see where uh, the flow of uh, operations uh, is being, you know, uh, topped or being stalled and what is really happening inside that is stopping things from happening outside. So there is a balance between external and internal. Mm-hmm. I think I think this is where we have to dive in a little bit more because in order for them to achieve this, you've mentioned that you have a pre perspective of what's going to happen, like you had your own vision as a leader of how things can be improved here. But do you stop here at your own vision? What if you need more insight? What if, what uh, if yes. there is something missing? The answer is that your great vision may become a reality, but it won't look exactly like what you thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I can tell you in 100% of the cases um, that I've been involved in, that's always been the case. But the point is what comes out at the other end, if you stay true enough to the radical nature of what you're doing, becomes much, much better than the status quo. And that's what's important. Mm. That's what achieves movement in this world and, and with our with our people. So yeah. Um yeah, what what I um what I say is as soon as you've defined your vision, expect people to come back and say, well, I don't like that. Or, mm. oh, I like it, but, or could we do it this way? And, you know, just just a thousand different perspectives. Um, relax, expect that, and realize that it is just feedback. It is a gift. And what they're doing is they are helping you build a consensus as to what really is a good new idea and what what re- what good would look like to most people. That is what builds strength in your idea. If you are a leader that is great at the evaluate stage and you cannot get people into the create because you can't get them on board with you or you're being too difficult or you know just too insistent on a particular way of doing something or a particular way uh, uh, that it's going to be when it's finished then you're going to fail as a leader but whether you're near charismatic or makes no difference, you just simply fail as a leader. I think this challenge from other people is exactly what you need because it tells you, ah, they think enough of my idea to critique on it. If they didn't think much of my idea, then, you know, they it's probably not a good idea. Yeah, surely challenging the status quo is the role number three in stage one the search for opportunity, and surely Mm -hmm. sensing people needs are the role number two in the same stage. In order to be able to tap into these two other roles, you really have to spend enough time in the evaluate, assessing the environment role. You might be blinded to some aspects in the environment that does not reveal themselves until you are challenged enough, until you bring people on board. You need to remain curious and listen and open and flexible. Mm -hmm. And one thing I have observed leaders do is they bring on board in their leadership team other new elements, which means they're not satisfied with the current expertise. They first evaluate is the leadership team, and, and this is one major element in in the six conditions for high-performing teams is that they have to be diverse. And I have seen a new charismatic leader uh, when they were appointed. uh, They decided to evaluate their own team first. If they are the right team, people have different experiences, expertise, and the expertise has to be diverse. And they told me that they brought in people from different departments with different knowledge and background so they can get the right feedback on their vision because they came in with a vision, just like you described, and you came in with a proposal. And I have observed other leaders hire consulting firms to do the work. Some leaders think, oh, we have our internal uh, intelligence unit. They can give us all the data we need. We don't need someone from outside. Your internal intelligence or data, they can be tainted because they're in the environment. 
outsiders sometimes they are the right people to give you the right perspective you need someone to help you assess the situation properly yes that that is absolutely true regardless of whether you're starting an organization or whether you're coming in to transform one um you know i i've seen people on both sides of the fence some say i'll always hire an outside consultant and others say never hire one i think that that's just way too simplistic you know if if you look at the nature of the change that you want to make and in many cases it's going to be quite big it would be silly not to get external opinion because no organization no matter how good the people inside it no organization can be truly objective as to what is going on in the market and that's exactly why um as you described earlier that uh, you know youngsters for example are getting together on social media and they're just making change happen and all of a sudden that just pops up and a company is is blindsided by it so you know having an external view sometimes can be extremely valuable because it says well did you know that there are these three uh, sort of splinter groups if you like that are trying to do something like what you're doing well that's important to know because perhaps they're going to topple you later on or before you're successful or on the other hand perhaps that's a huge resource that you need to grab a hold of and and ride the wave with them um so you know i i think it depends on if you've got really good people inside the organization i would not want to disenfranchise them and make them feel that they've been passed over so i would definitely make sure they have a role in helping to clarify and define what the vision is and how one achieves it but i think there also needs to be some external influence as well providing perspective and that if the leader cannot get both sides to recognize the value in each of those um then they're not doing the job properly yes and there's a danger of hiring an external individual which is a consultant and they could be cheap because they're just one person but i have seen strategic plans fail because of just one person he could have good relationships with someone and other bad relationships with someone else you know having just a one individual being your own consultant is is not a healthy as a coach is fine but if you really want them to get into the organization and do work for you with other people you really may, need to make a mixture of a team of internals and externals and, and not just one person i know it's easier i know you have the cost but that's not going to help you get a wider bigger view holistic view of the assessment yeah i i totally agree with that um the purpose of a coach of course is sort of individual usually one on one or one with a very small group to achieve certain increases in skill set whereas what we're talking about here is sort of external consultancy which is looking at the entire environment of um uh the the with well, the environment in which you're trying to make the change so to me um hiring a one person consulting company isn't going to do it unless you're very very tiny as an organization yes um, yeah. in fact i made a rule um that when i hired consultants to help me in in my uh career um when the consultant team came in to present and they were bidding for the work Uh, i would ask them some really challenging questions and i'd have my team ask them very challenging questions and the team that would actually disagree with each other as they spoke with us um would typically win the business ah. because i don't want a branded um consistent cons uh, approach that isn't going to be questioned mm -hmm. i want to see a team that is sitting together and they're and they they they're grappling with the question that we've got and you know there may actually be a little disagreement in the team that tells me that they're not afraid to talk about the real issues in front of their potential client which is fantastic yeah. um yeah you know and and i know i'm different you know there are other leaders that that say oh no i don't like that i want them all to be buttoned up and i want them to know what they're talking about but the fact is for this kind of consulting you want a group that is investigating 
that is saying, what else is out there? Am I missing something? Well, if they're not willing to challenge each other, yes. what are the chances that they're really going to challenge us unless they just happen to find some really good research somewhere? And yeah, then yeah. you're basing your whole strategy on a chance. Yeah, I just don't think that's the right way to go. And I have seen an organization, a large one, where the leader, a new charismatic leader again, they hired two consulting firms. The kind of assessment they needed is radical and strategic, and they brought the two consulting firms on the table to draw the strategy. These two consultancies are competitive in the market. Mm -hmm. They did it this way specifically because they wanted what you have just mentioned, a perspective, the option analysis. And, and, and that they, brought diversity. They did it. It brought the yes. huge diversity. And they mm -hmm. were able as well to mobilize the board of directors and get them involved with the consultants. This is why the board of directors exist. They advise. Yes. And they were able to draw upon mm -hmm. uh, internal leaders and bring them on board. So that it was a team of vibrant consultants. Uh, I realize that we're reaching the end of our episode again. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this has been really very interesting uh, to talk about. Uh, but thank you, Martin. It was very informative um, tapping on your own experiences. Good. Yeah, my pleasure, God. I think uh, we're, we're really getting into, um, you know, the, the how-tos uh, now. And, um, you know, hopefully the uh, listeners are beginning to realize that, you know, this, this is not rocket science, that there is a... Uh, a straightforward way that you can develop neocharismatic leadership skills yourself. And um, I'm looking forward to the next episode. The next one. So Here's the thing. This is the most crucial stage in the whole model. If a leader can make it right in this first role, the rest will become easy because he will be very confident in challenging the status quo and getting people's buy-in Let's go for it. Next time, we're going to talk about the second role, uh, sensing people's needs. And see you soon. I'm intrigued. Goodbye. <laughs> bye bye. Garda and Martin, hope you enjoyed this episode. There is more information available at neocharismaticleadership.org. And if you would like to discuss coaching or training for yourself or your team, you can contact Garda and Martin through the website. We look forward to your participation next week. Until then, goodbye.